Hello everyone, this is Mark Sabatella from Mastering MuseScore and welcome to the MuseScore Cafe. This is my live stream series I do every week uh, where we talk about some aspect of making music with MuseScore and um, uh, usually I have a particular theme that we're going to talk about, uh, but today is the first Wednesday of the month, and this is the Ask Me Anything session. So that means I don't have a particular theme in mind. I'm just here to answer your questions. And uh, so I, I put a, a pinned note at the beginning here just to kind of suggest that people um, uh, go ahead and put use the emoji button like when you type your comments into the chat you'll see an emoji button underneath and if you you use that you can put a question mark that nice big red question mark like I use there and that'll help your question stand out so that it doesn't get lost among any other comments and by all means if I'm missing something just let me know if there's a comment if there's a question that I just totally didn't see just let me know and I will try to come to it. So I have a couple of questions that were already kind of queued up from people posting in the community that I want to get to. And one of them, uh, and Peter, it might actually take me a moment to really uh, dive into yours because it's, it's a little gnarly, <laughs> I'm gonna say, but I am gonna load the score and uh, get people thinking about it and then we'll kind of get into it more. So Peter's questions, it, it's, it's a variety of related questions around the idea of um, uh, wanting to have ties that go into kind of repeated sections, ties into second endings and ties across repeats and things of that nature. Oh yes, and, and your question specifically, you were using MuseScore 3, so I'll make sure I load it in there. Uh, the story hasn't changed though. Um, but I, I'd like to knock off a couple of quick questions first, uh, if I at all can. And actually, what I really want to do um, is get my coffee because <laughs> I hit the I hit the coffee I hit the button uh, to start my coffee right before I started the session, and I can see it and smell it, and I need to go grab it. So what I'm going to do is um, uh, we're going to listen to the look of love here being played back in MuseScore while we wait for additional questions to perhaps come in, and. Um, uh, also, Graham had brought up a question about chord symbol alignment. That's a little easier for me to talk about, and I'll actually use uh, this piece as an example to talk about that. In my uh, um, you know newsletter article, I talked about how to align things, and Graham's question was more about the aesthetics of you know when when is it worth the trouble of uh, aligning things, and when is it um, when is it maybe better to leave them off? So, give me one second. Oh, I'm going to hit the play button here. Uh, we'll let it play the way Peter has it set up in MuseScore 3. Um, oh, that would be this window here. And let's hear. Oh, MuseScore 3 won't play because uh, I've the way I've got things set up, I can only play one at a time. So uh, I'm going to play it with MuseScore 4, and that's how we're going to talk about it anyhow because, the, as I said, the process is going to be the same. So let's listen to some music for a second while I grab my coffee. Okay, and so right there, uh, we uh, get to the, the first place where that question exists. Uh, so what's going on is, you know, there's this tied note going into that repeated section. And, um, you know, Peter's trying to find ways of getting the playback of that to work. I mean, it, it, it'll certainly, if you, d if you didn't do anything funny, it would certainly uh, play that tie normally, but it's the fact that you're also, I think, trying to do some fancy things to make it also handle the, the tie into the repeat. Um, although I don't see the repeat sign in here going back to that. So am I looking at the wrong place? Uh, that's a good question. This repeat sign here doesn't appear to actually connect to that. So Peter, you might have to explain a little bit. I see a D minor chord down here with the, the low Ds in the bass, but at the end of the repeat, at, at the actual repeat, I don't see that, I, I don't see those notes. So I guess that is the idea that you just want it to be on the downbeat 
for the second time and not be anticipated. So yeah, that's going to be tricky. <laughs> and this is going to be tricky. So I am going to come back to this. But meanwhile, um, uh, still looking to see if there's any nice quick questions. Um, but yeah, I, I will be dealing into this. So here's what I wanted to say as far as the quick thing about uh, Graham asking about chord symbols, uh, the alignment. So in this particular score, there's not any issue with the alignment of the chord symbols. There, are, you know, the, the the score doesn't involve things going high above the staff that's when we would have a problem. So if you have multiple voices, and so the soprano is kind of got stems up and sticking out above, or if you've got super high notes with maybe articulations on them, those are things that could push the chord symbols up. So like if this F was an octave higher. So notice that right now with that octave higher, you score, because Peter has done that thing that I talked about of, um, uh, of uh, uh, setting that setting, uh, I'll just show you again in case you didn't uh, see the article I did that's in format, style, and then chord symbols. Uh, these settings here where it says maximum shift above, maximum shift below. They might be set by default in the jazz templates. I'm not sure. I might have set that up that way. I can't remember. But those settings are what allows MuseScore to automatically align these. But then we have to ask, was that good? Is it good to push all of these chord symbols so high above the staff just because one of them was? That's a judgment call. And so um, let me uh, get here where I can be seeing uh, seeing the chat more. Um, so yeah, definitely a judgment call call about this. And so what I like to do is I like to look at examples and I have my real book <laughs> buried under here. Um, oh, actually I have a bigger size real book here, even better. Ugh. Give me a second. Mm. Those, that's the sound of books falling off my uh, chair. This is the real book. Uh, which is a popular fake book that um, I worked on volumes two and three and four of. And right here on the page that I'm open to, which is not deliberate, you can see an example of exactly the thing that I'm talking about. Um, so can you see it? Uh, if I hold it up better, does that help? Let's see. Oh man, this book is falling apart. Um, let me um, pop over here for a second and just make sure that I'm making it visible. So can you see that this chord right here, this F chord, is higher than everything else? Everything else is aligned really nicely, but that F is just a high because it's got the multiple voices there. It has uh, two voices there, so that F note on the staff has stem up, and it's got accent marks on it. And all that business is pushing the F chord symbol high above the staff. It would have looked kind of bad to push everything on that system uh, higher just to match that one that was out of alignment. So that's a really good example. And I was glad I was able to find that as quickly as I could. So Don, if you couldn't see that, make sure you're not full screen or... Make sure you don't have, because normally you should have a, um, uh, actually, let me just turn off my screen share for a second. Turn off my screen share and just hold it up one more time. So talking about this here, there should have been the little thumbnail, but depending on what you're doing with your browser, uh, it might be, um, uh, it might be hidden. So it's this F chord you can see is higher than everything else on that system. And that's kind of deliberate. So um, there you go. So yeah, mostly I want to be showing you my screen, but for that, it was definitely nice not to, right? So um, yeah, that is perfectly acceptable. So let's talk about how I would do that here. If I decide that, you know what, that is just too much. It's too much to make everything align just because that one chord symbol was, um, was off. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to format style chord symbols. And instead of using three as the maximum shift, I'm going to pick a smaller value. If, if you pick zero 
as your uh, maximum shift, it's not going to align anything. But if I just reduce that, say, to two, two and a half even, you can see that now MuScore has said, okay, that thing is too far away. It's more than two and a half spaces out of alignment. So everything else would have had to move more than two and a half staff spaces. That's too much. So yeah, maybe a value, when I've been saying that three is a good value or even three to five, maybe I'm overshooting it. Maybe, maybe a value of two is better. So if I use two as my value here, notice what will happen now. If that note comes a little bit lower, like right now that note is only a C, then you know now it, it moves all the chord symbols because it doesn't have to move them too far. But as soon as that C gets a little bit further, music course like, okay, that's too much, right? So this is what you want to do is find a value that works. I've been saying three is the right value. Now I think maybe two or two and a half is even better. So um, uh, that's my thing. Um, so that's my comment about the, the the chord symbols and the alignment. It's really kind of a judgment call, but um, you know, you also want to maybe try to do things to minimize how much that happens. By the way, I did see that someone had raised their hand. I don't even know how the raise hand thing works when we're uh, when you're not live. But if you've got a question, just put it in the chat. Is is how you're going to do it. You're going to put things in the chat. I see that James is asking about someone proofreading, uh, having help uh, proofreading a score. And yeah, I would recommend just posting that into uh, the community and see who bites. But maybe here um, would also be a good place uh, to uh, see if someone wants to volunteer and, and kind of hook up, uh, hook you up a little bit with some information. So, um, so. Again, this is the Ask Me Anything session, so I want to make sure that people, uh, if you have questions, you can be asking them here. But um, uh, since we don't have anything else yet other than James looking for uh, help with proofreading, and I definitely would love to see James get some help here. Um, uh, James, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself at all and say anything about what's going on and what you're what you're up to and, uh, um, you know, why you might be looking for help on proofreading, um, but uh, that would be good, uh, you know, uh, good to share. So what I think Peter has done here is attempt to fiddle. And so now that I'm looking at this, I see uh, that, yeah, the um, the ties here are funny in MuseScore 4. So I do want to go back to MuseScore 3 to take a look at that again, because I think what manual adjustments i think peter had done some manual adjustments on these ties um because they're fake is is what i think is going on i think these are um i think he's doing something to fake these ties uh which is why it didn't play as a tie so let's see what these are you say they're ties so yeah you actually you might have to explain to me what you did here peter so This note here is tied, and then it says it's tied into the next measure, but it certainly didn't play that way. So I'm not sure what you actually did to cause that uh, play to play funny. Um, yeah, so uh, maybe it was just the chord symbol that I was hearing. You, I think you said you had turned off chord symbols, but the way you turn off chord symbols is different in MuScore 3 versus 4. So I'm going to just turn them off globally here and listen to this again. Ah, okay. So you, all you did was the manual adjustment of the uh, lengths of those slurs. So um, that manual adjustment shouldn't be necessary. And I think whatever adjustment you did is causing it to look funny in uh, MuScore 4. But in MuScore 3, I think you had elongated them. I don't know. Yeah, they're, they, when I reset them, maybe. Maybe it's just a bug. I don't know. Um, so the deal is you, um, you want things to, uh, on the repeat, to play back differently, right? That is the idea. You want the repeat to uh, like honor that tie somehow or not honored as the case may be. And so that's what you're struggling with a little bit here. I'm gonna point you, uh, Peter, to um, 
to an article. Uh, and then we're going to talk about that article as we can find it. But as I said, it's, it's really kind of an in-depth thing that might be a bit much here. Um, but depending on how many other questions there are, that could be fine. Um, so Graham, I want to ad address your question while I find the how-to article here. Graham is saying you have to adjust the size and magnification. It should be 100%, should be your default. So I guess I'm not sure what you mean by that. Uh, but you can set the default ma uh, magnification. Let's uh, let's do that. If I go to edit preferences and then under canvas, you'll see the default zoom is set to 100%. So that's what should be the case. It should be, that's the default. And if you want it to be bigger or smaller, you can pick a different value there. I understand that there is a bug uh, uh, affecting like if you have multiple monitors and they have different screen resolutions and you open on one screen versus the other, there can be some confusion over which what the zoom value means. And maybe that's what you're you're dealing with. I'm not sure. But um, uh, in, in any case, it should be, the default zoom should be 100 percent, which should be literally the same size as the piece of paper. Um, so uh, Rachel is asking also about putting graphics onto a cover page. And yeah, this is definitely possible and I can show that real quick. If I want this title frame here to become a, a whole separate title page, I'm gonna select it and hit Control Enter to add a uh, page break. And so now there's a page break there and it's a page to itself. And then all I have to do is right click this thing and say add image. And now I can select any image that I happen to have on uh, on my system, here's an uh, here's a cover gradient here. That's one I had created for that. And then you can take this thing and uh, right size it how you want. And then you can also use the properties panel to make sure under the appearance section that you send it to the back so that uh, color that image is behind the text. So that's how you do that. All right. Um, and yeah, I, there was a whole article about this. And let me actually do this because it's something that I think a lot of people aren't so aware of. Um, I'm going to, let's make sure, hmm, uh, I'm gonna make sure that what I do doesn't cause me to lose, uh, lose my connection because I made that mistake once before. But what I want to do is I want to show you guys that the search facility in the community is getting um, it's getting more sophisticated by the week. They keep adding features to it, and it is getting to the point where it's now um, kind of cool if you know what, how to use it. So the search facility is this box at the top of the screen. And uh, again, I seem to be there. Um, if you click in the search box there, it opens up the little search box, you know, an actual dialogue here. And then try this, try cover page. And uh, here we go. Here's an article I wrote, titles, right? So there's, um, and I think that's actually the thing. I think that was right there, the thing. That's the tip of the week. So that's how you get it. So that search box took me right to a pretty good article there. But also check this out, um, titles. Um, that finds the posts about titles. But also, you can look at comments where other people have mentioned the word comment, but lessons. This takes you directly to the lessons within my courses. So here's uh, um, the lesson on using frames for additional content, which is exactly what this is about. So that search box is getting more sophisticated and it's going to become even more so. So while I have this up, Peter, uh, I'm going to do this. Uh, Mu score how to tie into second ending. I'm pretty sure that's what the article is called, how to create ties leading into a second ending. That looks like the thing. So uh, I wish I knew why sometimes Chrome decides to put all this other crap into the URL. But Peter, I'm gonna post this. Um, into the chat. There we go. Um, so what was the title of the lesson on title page? Malou, I'm not sure what you're asking me. I'm sorry. Um, 
if if you mean what happened when I type cert when I type title into the uh, um, oh uh, I think I understand what you're asking me. So when I did the search here and I I typed cover page, no, I just typed title right. And uh, the and then I went over to lessons here, and you can see the lesson is called "Using Frames for Additional Content." And then if you click that, it will take you right there. Not only will it take you right there, this is really cool. Check this out. Okay, I'm wrong about that. I thought it was going to take me to the right spot within the video. There's other places where that does happen, but there's some places where it takes you to the actual spot within the video where that happened. There's certain ways where the search does that. All right. So yeah, the search box used to be uh, a little bit more hidden, and when they started adding these new features to it, they uh, also then uh, made it a bit easier to find. So Peter, that article, let's take a look at that article here and see some of the things that it's going to talk about. There's how to create ties leading into a second ending, and they show this example here. Basically, everything that you were asking about was a variation on this idea, right? Some form of variation on the idea. Let me uh, pin my... Uh, pin this here so I can still see it. Um, there we go. Uh, this kind of situation where you're tying into the first ending and then also want it tied into the second ending and want to somehow figure out how to make that work right. Um, uh, this and then the same thing is true if you're trying to tie back from the end of the first ending to the beginning or if you're trying to tie into a coda. They're all variations of the same uh, the same thing. So um, this article has a whole bunch of hacks to, that are partial solutions to the problem. None of them are great. None of them are great. They all have issues, reasons why they're not good. This is definitely something that is known as something that we would want to uh, fix. But I will tell you the one, uh, yeah, I, I don't even have a favorite in here. But I will say, look at this article. Um, text is out of focus. That probably depends on your screen resolution or your internet connection speed. Usually, the, as long as I'm moving it, it certainly will be. So that's true. Let me uh, just leave it still. But um, but yeah, just go ahead and use the use the link I pasted in the uh, chat to to get that text yourself rather than trying to read it on the screen. So. Um, yeah, all these different solutions. This one here of an invisible voice and ties, that's not a bad one. The invisible ties. So it, it Each one has its advantages and disadvantages that are all summarized here. This one fixes the layout and gives playback, but there's caveats, right? Some of them look good, don't sound right. Some of them sound right, don't look good. There's, there, it's, it's a can of worms. So, um, Sorry that I, again, I don't have a good answer, but I definitely want you to be able to read through that article and try some of those things out. And then, you know, as we have time, you know, maybe I'll do a separate little article just on that to go through it. So let's come back to the chat here and just see. Um, I still don't have any other specific uh, questions here other than Stephen is saying something about the stretch. Um, to put two measures on the same staff. Oh, yeah. Um, Okay, so if you're talking about those ties uh, that were in this example here, I mean, there's something to be said for wanting this section to start on the beginning of a system. But it's also the case if I remove the break that's here and then uh, also reduce stretch between here, like I select these measures and then press the reduce stretch command a few times, it'll eventually compress things to the point where that is uh, the left curly brace, by the way, is the reduce stretch command. So that now those measures are on the same system and then the tie will look perhaps a bit better. But this is not necessarily as good a form for readability, starting the repeat at the end of one system. It's not necessarily as good. So I'm still a little curious then why in MuseScore 4, uh, there was this weird glitchy thing with those ties. I'm not aware of any bug with that. 
Uh, so, but maybe it has to do with the start repeat being buggy. Let's find out. I'm going to put here and put in a T. Yeah, it's just, um, that is weird. I'm not, I'm not sure that that has ever been reported before. Is it, it, I'm guessing it has to do with this repeat sign. Get rid of the repeat sign and it's fine. So I think ties coming immediately after repeats don't look very good. So, um, so, by the way, MuseScore 4 does have, instead of having to reduce stretch, MuseScore 4 has a much more straightforward way of saying you want these measures all on the same system. I have them selected. And now if I come over to the palettes and go to the layout palette, this guy here that says keep measures on the same system will perform magic. You do that, and now those measures are on the same system. When I say it performs magic, check this out. I'm going to select a ridiculous number of measures here and then tell it, keep them on the same system. It did it, right? It looks stupid. It's everything's overlapping. It's crazy. But you can force, you can force, here, select the entire score, force it onto one system. And uh, boy, those chord symbols are uh, throwing everything off. So now let's delete the chord symbols. Select all the chord symbols and delete them. And now you can see, wow, look at that. The entire score crammed onto one system. So this is new in 4.1, the ability to easily select some measures and just force them onto the same system. So anyhow, um, undoing my changes here. So, um, uh, so, yeah, as far as the playback goes, Peter, unfortunately, again, I'm, I'm continuing to come back to this because it's, it's the kind of thing where I'm going to have to sit and work through this. And I don't feel like I can do that, like on the spur of the moment so well. But um, let's let's try something here. Um, I'm going to look back at your question as you originally worded it in the community. Um the way you worded it was you said, it was here in the cafe. By the way, y'all noticed this um, new layout. This showed up about half an hour ago. <laughs> I've known it's been coming for a while, but now it's going to be the case that uh, it'll be a little easier to see that this is the actual current event coming up and the, the join button will be right there. So it'll be slightly easier once we get used to this new layout for this, uh, this screen here. But when I click this here, I can look uh, I thought that's where Peter's comment was. Now I'm not sure where the comment was. Peter, where'd your comment go? Um, <laughs> there it is. Oh, was it? Oh, oh, it was. I don't even know what's going on here. Um, okay, so uh, the questions are, has pickup, first ending does not tie. So on playback, first measure chord does not play because it was tied. How does one fix that? And yeah, I would use an invisible invisible notes. So if on the repeat, that chord doesn't play, and I don't know if that's still the case in MuseScore 4, but let's find out. Oh, I turned off repeats. Let me turn repeats back on. Aha. Yeah, didn't play, right? So what I'm going to do is just use invisible voice two notes. So I'll go in here and in voice two, control alt two for voice two, enter my F and make it invisible. Shift A, invisible. Shift C, make it invisible. Shift D, make it invisible. And then on, on the bottom staff, same thing, uh, dotted quarter. D, whoops, switch back to voice two, um, dotted quarter, D, invisible, shift A, invisible, and, um, and then also should need to hide these rests, invisible, invisible, and this rest here, invisible. So now when I go to play this, I'm going to hear those notes.
right? So I heard them. Now, the question is, am I going to hear weirdness? Because on the first time through, it's going to play both voice one and voice two. Yeah, I kind of did. Um, so what I would want to do is turn off the playback of the voice one notes, right? So I'd have to do that. And I think I got something wrong in my, uh, I think I, in actually, maybe... Yeah, I'm not sure if I accidentally if, if adding those invisible notes may have messed up the the spacing of of this chord. Anyhow, that's something to play with. That's something to play with. So as you can see, this is kind of laying hacks on top of hacks. So it's um it's an unfortunate situation with not a good solution. So yeah, so there you go. So Peter, you're absolutely right. It's not going to sound tied the first time through. So yeah, there's not good solutions. That is the answer. There's hacks, partial workarounds, and then you choose your poison. So read through that article, and then you'll get to figure out what works best for your particular setting. But there's not a good answer. How do you turn off repeats was the question there. So that is one that's different between MuseScore 4 and 3. In MuseScore 4, it's the gear icon here, and then play repeats is in here. That's also where I can toggle the playback of chord symbols. So this is where you can decide if you want to hear repeats or not, whether you want to hear chord symbols or not. And then in MuseScore uh, 3, the play repeats button is right on the toolbar. So you can turn that off there. Um, so, um, uh, and for chord symbol playback in MuseScore 3, it's a lot more complicated. You don't just have a single button there to turn off chord symbol, but what you do is you would select a chord symbol and then go to the inspector, turn off its playback, and then also uh, hit the uh, set as style button here. I gotta make this window a little bigger to be able to see my set as style button. I'll just make it a lot bigger. Um, so if I select a chord symbol and turn off playback here and then click the set as style button there, I guess I'm just going to have to scroll over to see it. Set, click the set as style button. That will make non-playback the style for the score. That's how you would do it in MuseScore 3. So then I also saw a question coming in about, uh, I already forgot what it was but it was one with an easy answer, um, con sordino, con sordino, right, with mute. Um, so uh, this exists uh, for brass instruments in, um, so I, you know, muted brass in the default sound font uh, in both MuseScore 3 and 4, but it, I assume you're talking about violin mutes, which is a different thing, right? There's a thing you stick in, in between your strings. I would assume that there will eventually be samples added to Muse sounds. I don't expect that will ever happen in a sound font, or but some VSTs probably have it. So some VST instruments probably have uh, um, con Consordino um, already implemented. Muse sounds might have it implemented. I don't know for sure, but it's definitely not hooked up, right? If you add that indication, it's not gonna show, it's not gonna play back, but yeah. It is absolutely expected. I mean, we're on version 1.0, basically, of Muse Sounds, right? This is the very first release of Muse Sounds. It's only a few months old. Um, by the time it's, you know, mature, been out for a few years, I will expect more and more markings to be supported, more instruments to be added, et cetera. So, um, oh, Stephen, that was just a way to check the ties. I get what you're saying, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think I've pretty much decided that the repeat sign is the cause of the bad ties. So let's do something because some of you probably haven't seen this before. I want to find out if that's been reported or not because that's a bug, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip over to um, uh, a, a web browser and I'm going to go to GitHub. I'm going to. I'm, this is how I how I find the Git uh, MuseScore issue tracker. I type MuseScore GitHub issues into the search box. MuseScore GitHub issues. First hit is going to be the right one. And now within its search, I can type uh, a search term that I'm looking for. Ties repeat. And um, it's going to probably stuff about, yeah, this is not relevant, right? That's not at all. 
ties can be added to the beginning of a system when repeating a note. That's not a thing I'm talking about, the repeat bar line. Let's try just the word tie, not repeats. So this is instrument. I'm looking for a bug that says something about the uh, um, tie looking bad, and I don't see it. But here's another thing. I'm going to delete this part here that says is open because I'm a little bit wondering as if maybe it's already fixed for an upcoming release. So it might, the issue, if someone submitted it, might be closed already. So I'm going to delete that part that says is open and now do the search again and now see if there's any closed issues uh, that involve the repeat sign and the tie. Um, I'm still not seeing anything that specifically looks like it's related to that. So I'm going to say that no one has submitted this bug before and no one has noticed that that if you have a tie going, uh, um, you know, a tie coming after a start repeat that they look terrible. I guess no one's reported that before. So it's going to be our job to do that. I also am now wondering, you know, because that chord here, I had all those invisible notes and it I feel like see what I mean this D here should be flipped to the other side of the stem and I feel like having added those invisible notes somehow messed that up. Yeah, once I started adding the invisible notes, it messed up the um the arrangement of the notes on the stem, which I'm surprised by because usually that wouldn't happen. Invisible notes shouldn't be affecting what's going on here. So that could be another bug to try to uh uh work out what's going on with. So that little tour through the bug reporting system is one that I feel like um, is good for people to have. So the question is, what else have I possibly missed? Um, and I don't think I'm missing anything. So, you know, I'm still stuck on Peter's uh, repeat example here. Let's try something else, right? So I, I know I can't, can't fix that first one, but I'm going to see if I can find a solution to one of your others. See if one of your others has uh, a, a relatively simple solution. How do you indicate there's no tie on that first measure? Uh, okay, so this is just an, a notation question. What should we do to say that that isn't going to be tied here? Because, yeah, like you said, on the repeat, this note isn't tied. Um, put them in parentheses is what I would say. Put those ties in parentheses. So I'm going to flip back to MuseScore 3 so they look better and put uh, put everything back the way it was. I'm gonna wanna add parentheses to those ties, I think. Now, there's not a straightforward to do that. Some symbols have easy ways to add parentheses. If I select a note and then press the parentheses key, it adds parentheses. That's nice. Same for accidentals. Select an accidental, press uh, shift nine, basically, it adds parentheses. But they're nothing like that for ties. So uh, ties aren't going to work that way. So I'm going to have to add those parentheses kind of manually. So what I'm going to do is select the note here, and I'm going to go to the master palette, and I'll show you how to do it in a way that works for both three and four. We're going to go to view, and then master palette, and then down here, the symbols section. And I want to type in here bracket. And there's different brackets of different sizes. Actually, how about paren? Okay. Some, you know, I, I was thinking uh, since it was developed by some British people, the standard was uh, that they would just call these all brackets. But no, they call them parentheses. So I want to find this. This is a double height left parentheses. Hey, that sounds kind of cool. Let's add it. Ah, that looks like a decent size. Let's just drag that into place. And there we go. I might need to make sure I've disabled autoplays for it. And then I, oh yeah, so notice that as soon as I started moving it around, MuseScore said, hey, I'm going to rearrange things for you. So we're going to have to disable um, autoplays for it. But I'm also going to attach uh, an, the right parentheses. So here's the right parentheses, and then drag that somewhere reasonably into position. And now I'm going to disable automatic placement for the right one, click the left one, disable automatic placement for it. And now I've got parentheses that I can, you know, kind of finagle and put around those ties somehow. Something like that would probably be the way to do it. And you could just keep uh, um, 
I keep fiddling with that. If you don't like the fact that that the that the parentheses is kind of crossing into that other tie, we could actually shorten that other tie to just get it in there and uh, have it look like that. I don't know. Uh, I don't have a good answer for that either. You know, sometimes quite, sometimes I don't have good answers. I just have things we can try. Thomas's question about uh, a particular kind of time signature. Um, let me uh, flip over to the main window so I can actually see your image. Ooh, I can't. Oh, that's because I'm still looking here. Uh, oh, okay. I see what's going on here. You've got alternating measures of 4-4 four, four, and 6-4. Did I just hang up? Did I just do the same mistake I made? Uh, I'm back. No panic. It went dark for a second, right? But I am back. I'm back. Um, I'm back. Uh, I have to remember that if I try clicking on someone's image, uh, that I will um, potentially lose uh, what I'm doing. I have to remember that. So, but I saw what it was. I saw what you were talking about. It was a... Um, uh, alternating 4-4 four, four, and 6-4. So there's not really super direct support for it, but I'll show you how we can get it. Um, oh, is I, so are we not, when you say um, audio video link up, hopefully it is. Um, hopefully it's okay now. So <clears throat> I'm going to show you how to create that sort of 4-4, four, 6-4 four, four alternating thing. It's not pretty either, but it does work. So I will go ahead and create a grand staff here. And first, let's actually create the uh, time signature. So I'm creating my score. I think I'm creating my score. There it is. I'm going to click this time signature. And in the properties panel, go to time signature properties. And I want to change this to say 4 plus 6 4 plus four. Uh, yeah, this isn't going to be exactly what you want, but take a look at what we got. This is close, right? It's got those plus signs in it that we don't need. The problem is if I leave out the plus signs, it's going to look like 4644. There's not a way to get a space in there that I'm aware of. I don't think there's a way to put a space in there. Yeah. I don't think there's a way to put a space in there. So the plus is how we do it, and it's still going to be reasonably well understood. Now, notice when I changed that, it only changed the uh, the top staff. I want to get it onto the bottom staff also. So what I'm going to do is control shift drag that time signature to the bottom staff, and that will copy it basically to the bottom staff. Now it's still. Uh, oops, I pressed M. Uh, um, C D E F. D, D, E, F. You, you can see here, let me make sure that my, uh, um, here we go. Uh, make sure the chat's all hunky-dory. Um, so you can see it's still 4-4 across the board, right? It's not really alternating, but we can insert two more beats into this measure. There's a couple ways of doing that. Perhaps the easiest is when you're in node input mode, we're going to use control shift letter to insert another note. So if I insert a G with control shift G, now I got an extra G. Control shift A, and I got another A. So now I've got six beats in this measure. Then there's other ways of doing it. You can also long click the uh, node input icon, switch to this insert mode, and now every time I insert, every time I type notes, it's adding more and more beat. I don't like that mode so much because then I have to remember to turn it off by returning to regular step time, but it, it is an option for sure. Um, the other way would be to select a measure and um, right click it and go to measure properties and tell it you want six. 
beats in that measure. You're going to have to do this every other measure for the whole score. There's not going to be like a, 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 a convenient automatic way of just getting that to happen. But at least it's possible. Um, so the question is, if I use a minus, would it disappear? So that's a great question, Don. And I was actually wondering the same because it's already the case that the plus is kind of hard to read, right? My suspicion, suspicion is that minus isn't supported either because I think it's just not a common thing to have in time signatures. Plus is. That's a very common notation for plus 6 over 4. Yeah, there is no minus. If I type a minus sign, I don't get anything. Here's the other thing I can do. This is actually more common, getting back to the original question. 4 plus 6 over 4, that's the more normal way to write that. If they're going to have the same... Uh, the same duration, the same note value as the denominator of the time signature, then this is normally how we notate it. Instead of 4464, four, four, we write 4 plus 6 over 4. That's why that plus sign even exists in time signatures. So the deal is that this plus sign here is a special plus sign designed specifically for time signatures to, to be the right size and so forth, and there isn't a special time signature minus sign because it's just not a thing. So. Um, so yeah, that was a good question there. All right, so here's what I lost when I was out for a minute. Uh, Susan asking, add POCO F to the Dynamics palette. All right, we can do that. It's going to be not as pleasant as in MuseScore 3, as in MuseScore 4 to do this, but we can absolutely get the job done. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to suggest, actually, to be honest, uh, I'm going to suggest uh, that you don't make it a separate, well, no, in MuseScore 3, that's just going to be the best way. So what I'm going to do is you want POCO F. So I'm going to open the Dynamics palette. I'm going to add the F, and then I'm going to double-click it because this is just text. And I'm going to move back to the beginning and type POCO. So now I have POCO F, and now I can control shift drag this thing back to the palette and now I've got POCO F there in the palette. Now I said this is going to be a little bit not pleasant in MuseScore 3. That actually wasn't so bad, right? Well what happens when I try to use it? We click a note, click the POCO F. It's not positioned very well. It's, um, it's, you know, you're going to have to adjust the position of it. MuseScore 4 has a different way of handling this where you would add the POCO as a separate text from the F, and then it's going to align them for you kind of automatically. Although actually, yeah, you could do it the same way in MuseScore 4, really. So if I want to do that in MuseScore 4, I can try it the same way. I can go to the Dynamics palette, add my F. Double click this guy, Poco. See, this alignment is more proper. It's aligned with the note, not bleeding into the previous measure. Um, a little more proper. Um, but it's also a little awkward because it makes the F look like it comes later. So it's not, it, it's not ideal no matter how you do it. It's like a decision you have to make about how you really want that to look. Um, but the other thing you can do in MuseScore uh, 4 is add them separately add F, and then we're going to add POCO as expression test, text, control E, POCO. It's going to, by default, put it after the dynamic, which allows the dynamic to be uh, directly aligned with the note. Um, is this as proper grammatically? No, but it is clearer <laughs> musically to see the forte right below the note and then the poco after it, right? So poco f is fine. You can do that, and then you can manually position things as you want. But the th new thing in MuseScore 4, specifically in 4.1, is that when you add expression text and dynamics to the same note, it will juggle them. And then if you go to the Properties panel, uh, you can see that option there, Snap to Dynamic. Without it, it puts it below, but with the Snap to Dynamic, it kind of aligns them that way. Um, yeah. Oh, avoid bar lines. That's another new MuseScore 4 -ism. If you uncheck that option, it uh, won't try to avoid the bar line. Now, what that means is if my Dynamic symbol, instead of POCO F, had been, uh, let's, let's add an FFFF. Um, let's come over to the palettes and add 
Let's add a one of those crazy ones with a whole ton of Fs. Let's add a ton of Fs. So, um, it's avoiding the bar line here because avoiding bar lines is often nice, but it's no longer centered. So if I come over to the properties panel and uncheck avoid bar lines, it will overlap them. So that's allowed. So what's the difference between POCO F and MF? See, you're the, that's an excellent question. Um, the thing is, you know, different composers will use different markings and just to try to convey what they think they mean, but there's not necessarily standardized definitions for a lot of things. So I, I tend to not overthink these sorts of things myself and just put just put in what I think is going to be simple and work. So I would probably just use an MF myself. But POCO F, a little F, you know, maybe it's somewhere between MF and F. You, you give five people, five musicians that same score, you're going to get five different interpretations, though. So it is it is definitely worth asking yourself to what extent you want to use notations that are a little off the beaten path. So, um, so Stephen, you're asking, could you just set up two bars initially and then copy them repeatedly? Yeah, you would love it if that were the case, but unfortunately it is not. It is not the case that you can do that. You, you, it, it'll copy the notes, but it's not going to copy the time signature adjustments. It's still going to stay 4-4. Four, four. So unfortunately, no amount of copying and pasting. Uh, if I try to take this 6-4 uh, measure here, you know, I've, I've added those two extra beats. If I copy this and paste it down here, those two beats are just going to bleed over in the next measure. So unfortunately, while someday that could be nice. Ah, so there you go. So if you're transcribing for open score, you want to use what the composer used uh, because that is the idea, or at least what the editor used. If you're working for, for a particular edition, it might be of dynamic marking that was added by an editor. But if that's the editor, if that's the edition you're working from, then you absolutely want to use it. And then you don't want to change things like changing F Poco. These are editor decisions, right? A, a modern editor might choose to make these changes. But if your goal is to reproduce a current, an, an existing edition, then absolutely you go with the POCO F. So I'm curious, Susan, in your example, um, does that occur at the beginning of a bar line? And if so, how is it aligned? Is it like uh, this here where the POCO is directly underneath the note and the F is just later? Or does he kind of fudge it, try to like adjust it so that it's kind of centered under the note or what? I'm a little curious how it looks in the uh, original um, version that you're working from. But yeah, you'll just have to try to make similar decisions. There will be manual adjustments no matter what because it's just not an ideal type of marking. So, uh, um, yeah, and it could be an addition thing, but, you know, I feel like, you know, what you said, poco means a little, right? And so poco a poco crescendo, right, a little by little crescendo, that word is used fairly often, and often we'll see it and barely even register in our brains that we've seen it. Um, and so sometimes we say, oh, I've never seen this before, and what it really means is I've never paid attention to it before. I can't guarantee that I've seen it. But I certainly won't swear that I haven't. Give me one second, and then, you know, if there's any more questions, I'll try to get a couple more in before I wrap up. Mm. Eh. Thought I had my Beethoven sonatas handy, but I think they're back at home. Uh, but I was just going to take a look and see if I uh, would see an example myself to, to see. You know, we could go to IMSLP, and um, so you're, you're presumably looking at a string quartet. So what I could do is go to a search engine and say Beethoven string quartet IMSLP, and uh, just take a look at uh, some random string quartet instead of getting the whole, I suppose I could have just gone for the whole set, but I'm just going to look at this one and just see, oh, this is like an older edition. We're not going to want this one because I know you're not working from that. How about the uh, the Breitkopf version? That's Those are always good safe choices. So, you know, I could then start scrolling through this string, string quartet to see if I happen to see a Poco F anywhere. Um, just to see what they do with it alignment wise. And I'm, here's, you know, sempre, okay, check that out. There's 
sempre più f right so what's going on here with it and here it is on the uh, lower staff so this sempre più, più f goes with the top staff and you can see they've kind of cheated the location of it. The sempre is kind of un is centered under the note. The pew and the F are way into the next measure. If you look at the second violin part, sempre presumably is trying to align with the first uh, um, note. But by the time you get to the F, we're already all, all the way to the end of the measure. So this is actually quite difficult to understand what you're what is being asked you have to understand that that F really applies at the beginning of the measure it is not a great choice it's there's not necessarily better choices if you're going to use verbose dynamics like that you're going to have that issue but that's a reason why a lot of editors would say no don't do that don't use ver verbose dynamic markings because they will create potential uh, ambiguity like that. So anyhow, there's an example of that, and I assume that if I keep looking, I will eventually find a POCO F as well. But whatever, that was text associated with uh, with the dynamic that, the, that came before the dynamic and pushed it, you know, it caused the alignment to be really kind of, frankly, weird. So that's that. All right. Going back and making sure I have, I'm not missing anything else in the chat. Poco F, Poco aligns under the first note. So there you go. Very much like that one we just saw with the Sempre. It aligned under the first note as well. So I'm not trying to make people dizzy with all my uh, flipping between scores and so forth. So I've did I miss any other questions is the point. I don't think so. I feel like there were not a ton of questions here, but a couple of them required a little depth, and Peter's was a huge can of worms that I I know I didn't really answer, but I maybe helped <laughs> uh, uh, find help you find answers and figure out what's possible. Um, so, um, and I showed you a couple other random things like how to use the search feature on my site and, um, you know, a little bit about searching for issues. So, uh, other than that, I think I'm caught up here. So, we're going to call this good. Before I actually um, sign off, I'm going to point out that, you know, t tomorrow is the Music Master class. And... Um, so, you know, we've started the Harmony course. Uh, many of you are participating in it, and I know, and thanks all all of you who are. I just, like, two minutes before this cafe started, posted our first project, and it's a very simple, basic project of taking a, a simple chord progression and writing a melody to it. And not just one melody, it's like a short chord progression. I want you to try out different melodies. And the goal isn't to come up with the best possible melody in the world. The goal is to explore the relationship between melody and chords, because understanding that relationship between melody and chords is something that we're going to be looking at through the rest of that course from the flip side. We're gonna be looking at an existing melody and trying to fit chords to it, which is like a new thing for most people. So I wanna start with the opposite side of that, which is maybe a little more familiar, especially if you're a jazz musician, starting with chords and putting a melody to it. And even if it's not already familiar to you, I think it's easier to approach. So in any case, that's what we're going to be looking at. Uh, that's the first project. And tomorrow I'll be exploring that a little bit more and whatever else comes up having to do with harmony. So uh, we're going to be just talking about harmony for a while now, coming up in the... Uh uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. Thanks for the questions. Uh, thanks for the comments. Thanks uh, for people helping each other out in here a little bit. And, um, yeah, this is what we do. So uh, this is the first week of the month, so we did the Ask Me Anything session. I mentioned in the newsletter, and also should have mentioned this at the beginning of this session, sorry, but next, no, the 23rd, Saturday the 23rd, I'm going to do a, a, like a half-day workshop. It's going to be something in the vicinity of say 11 to 3 Eastern. It'll be, uh, you know, kind of split the difference between this time. It'll be, um, you know, kind of afternoon Eastern time, which translates to early evening for, uh, for those of you in Europe and just a little, you know, morning for people here in Colorado. And uh, it'll be a, a, a half day workshop where we'll explore basically 
I will condense my entire course into four hours uh, and into one hour sessions is, is kind of how I'm looking at it. So I hope you all can make that. That'll be free to anyone who's a student in the Mastery Music Work course. So I'll be talking much more about that coming up. Thanks everyone and see you next time.